Um, first off, thank for, uh, thanks to Martin for the excellent talk. Um, but now it's time for mine. <laughs> um, for the last year, I've had the uh, opportunity to work on this awesome project for uh, the Olympics. Um, I've done that at, uh, at, at Gracenode, and I'll be telling you more about it uh, today. So first, uh, something about me. Why should you trust me? Um, <laughs> I'm a Scala developer and data engineer at CodeStar. I've been working here for uh, at least three years now. Uh, and I've mostly been doing stuff with uh, Kafka. That ranges uh, to uh, managing a cluster at Wacamp, um, to doing uh, library integration uh, between Kafka libraries and stuff with uh, logging uh, at, at the client, um, as well as doing just regular application development involving uh, Kafka. Um, I tend to like the UPSI side of development, so I, I really like digging into metrics, um, configuring my logging properly, um, and it, that, that kind of stuff, deployment pipelines, uh, all that jazz. Um, and also, as a small fun fact, I'm not the first of my family to do something relevant for the Olympics. <laughs> um, so a small thing about, uh, about CodeStar, uh, I think most of you already know by now since you've been here for about an hour, or maybe more. Uh, we're a small team of passionate developers, and we mostly focus on uh, functional and reactive uh, programming, uh, mostly with Scala and JavaScript as well as TypeScript. Um, and we have awesome clients um, like Gracenode. And Gracenode is a, a business to business company, mostly focusing on audio, video, uh, automobile, and since uh, somewhat recently also sports, with the most recent acquirement um, here in Nieuwegein as well as uh, Halifax, Canada. Um, it's a global company, it's all around the world, ranging from the US as well as um, Mumbai, uh, somewhere in Germany, here in the Netherlands and Canada as well. And the project we've been working on uh, has been called uh, Olympics Premium. And Olympics Premium is uh, basically a, a suite of widgets that uh, clients can embed on their website um, to give uh, a very good and nice overview of what's happening all around the Olympics. Um, and yeah, what do these widgets look like? So what you see here is an overview of um, the, the more basic stuff that we've been showing in terms of um, the medals that have been awarded all during the Olympics, um, breaking down, broken down per country, but as well as per, uh, per athlete. And there's also uh, historical data in there, which is uh, one of the, the hugest things about Grace Note Sports is that they just have this enormous database of all the Olympics and other sports events ranging back to whenever. Um, so there's also a nice view on that uh, on the widgets as well. Um, another nice thing is the, the schedule widget in which uh, people can see what events were coming up um, and when and give a nice uh, breakdown into digging deeper into these events and like getting the real uh, juicy details, which uh, most of my talk will be about. Um, so you see an example here for uh, Biathlon. Uh, we gave a very um, interesting view on um, what all the intermediate times are for every athlete on every intermediate position. I think you're seeing the 12th kilometer here, yep. Um, so you see that uh, some people have already uh, passed that point, so they already have an intermediate time, some other people haven't. Uh, you also see nice uh, penalties that people got because they missed some shots during the biathlon event. Um, so another one that is really good is this uh, short track widget where you see the, the intermediate times for every athlete as well as just the number of laps that they still need to uh, get through. Uh, a similar one is this one for uh, luge where people just dive down these slopes on, on their sleds. Uh, you see also the, the, the nice breakdown on intermediates but this one is a bit more interesting still because we see this information like uh, we have the current athlete here, this is her intermediate times, but also we have the, the leader that is uh, already finished, of course, and you see the, the next participant as well as at the very top uh, how many athletes already uh, completed their run. This is a very rich widget with uh, very life updating data. Uh, of which we see a second example here for a speed skating event where we see a nice breakdown um, 
per lap that people are um, going around the rink where you see the intermediate times, um, as well as what people have been doing uh, so far. So we nicely see Irene Wust at the first place here. Yay, Holland. <laughs> Uh, another nice one is this play-by-play uh, -play view on uh, ice hockey. So you uh, see in very much detail uh, what, what the scores have been so far, um, what penalties have been made by which athlete, as well as what goals have been made and who, who the athletes were that actually did the assist. Um, very detailed stuff. Um, we also have player statistics, which is just insane, but too much to show in this, uh, on this Beamer. Um, a smaller one for player statistics is this one for curling, where you nicely see the statistics for every athlete that is currently throwing his stones. And we even went a bit further than just these widgets that people showed on their websites, because we also had an integration with television, which was just completely awesome. People in, in the US actually saw this on their television, so that's really cool. Um, so how did we achieve building these widgets? Um, one of the, the biggest uh, boosts in that was uh, the Olympic data feed. Um, the Olympic data feed is, uh, well, let me just show you their own definition. Um, the Olympic data feed is a, a unique set of messages which can be delivered in real time which, and contain live sports-related data. Um, they include schedules, start list results, uh, et cetera, et cetera, even weather updates, which completely boggled my mind. Um, but basically... The ODF is a set of messages that is being sent by the Olympic uh, committees from every Olympic venue, and they just give all kinds of updates of, on, on, on what's happening during the event. Um, so, yeah, what does that look like? Um, we have a DT current file here. Sorry, it's XML, I know. <laughs> um, so at the very top, you see this document type. It's, it's DT current, and there's a document code which identifies um, for what kind of event this is uh, relevant data. So in this case, you see that, I, I think you can read it, it says uh, SBD for snowboard, and then W for women's, and then it's parallel giant slalom, and then a lot of dashes to make some space for um, events that might be a bit longer. And then you see that it's the eighth final, and then the fifth heath, and the first run, or something like that. Uh, and what you also see is that at this current time, there's these uh, two athletes, that are currently going down the slopes on um, the red and blue, with, with the red and blue bib, like the thing that they're wearing on their, uh, on their jerseys. And we also see which athletes will be coming up next. So this is already uh, kind of cool information that you can get about uh, the event. Um, one other example is this uh, DT result file for um, SSK for speed skating. Wait, let me just... I got the wrong slide. Anyway, <laughs> so what we see here is that um, this is a, use, a useful thing to enlarge. So we see this extended infos part, which shows starters 30 and the complete 18. I earlier showed that the progress bar, we built that one using that piece of information. But much more than that, this also shows for every athlete, it shows the results including intermediate ones and um, maybe some additional information. Um, I've seen for figure skating, it even contains information about what kind of triple gainer somebody did, and it's just very rich data. Um, but yeah, you get these XML files with data. That doesn't necessarily mean that you already have good widgets. You need to combine, combine these things uh, before you get there. Um, and that's where most of our work will be involved and I'll be telling you a bit more about uh, our architecture that we use to do that. Um, so coming up with the next uh, slide. Um, in a very basic way, we, we get the XML from the Olympic venues, um, which we um, ingest, put somewhere in storage, process the files, and put them ready uh, for an API to leverage um, which widgets can pull and then those widgets will be embedded on a client's website. Sounds kind of straightforward. Um, in, a in essence, it's, it, it really is. Um, <laughs> so in the past, GraceNode have, has been dealing with this uh, in, in this specific way. Um, when files are received, they are ingested by uh, just dumping them on, on a single file system and having uh, a file watcher watching those files, um, picking them up, extracting the relevant fields, and injecting that into a database. Once that is there, 
in, in, in some periodical moments, the data is being replicated over uh, to the calculation database, which then, um, from a series of database triggers and stored procedures, uh, calculates uh, derivative data, which can then be replicated over to another database, which uh, where it gets denormalized and then uh, put, it get, it, it's put ready for, for the API to, to use. Um, yeah, the main problem with this setup was that it just, just was just too slow. It took about 40 seconds for one single uh, file to basically reach an updated uh, piece of information in the API. And previously, 40 seconds might just be okay, but in this day and age, people, clients want it just to be faster. They want to be faster than um, social media, for example. It's just, you don't want to get beaten out by just anybody who's on Twitter. Um, and you also just need lower latency to get these rich features because if you look at that, that current block that I was showing earlier where you saw this athlete is currently going down the slopes, you want that to be just, you want that to be current. You can't be behind by a minute and then just slowing irrelevant data, uh, showing irrelevant data. Um, so we had to change this around a bit um, and that's how this uh, setup uh, originated. So we basically split up the flow in what we had been calling uh, classic, um, which we already saw, and we um, put a, a next um, fast lane, nicely dubbed uh, Bolt by one of my colleagues, <laughs> um, for processing the sports files uh, in, a, in, a, in a super fast way. And um, then the fast and the slow, slowish API can be combined together in, an, in another single API, which can be used by the widgets. Um, and with this separation between fast and, and, and classic data for, for long-term storage and historical uh, data, it also became possible to join in extra data um, that may not have a, a direct uh, place within the, the long-term database. Uh, for example, we also were able to now join in um, relevant data from the Olympic broadcasters about their own uh, video feed. I'll show you more about that later. Um, so I guess you guys can guess it for a bit what, what this fast pipeline looked like, but I'll show you a diagram. Um, so yeah, um, in, instead of putting si stuff directly on the file system, we let Kafka put it on its file system. <laughs> um, and from that point onwards, we used uh, basically Kafka streams to uh, process these updates, um, join together data, aggregate stuff, um, do all kinds of processing, mapping IDs to uh, IDs that were relevant in the, in the Gracenode database. Uh, all kinds of stuff, and once that processing has been finished, the data uh, in a, in a pre-processed manner is being put on another Kafka topic, which is then synced to uh, a MongoDB database, which can then be leveraged by a faster API. Um, so yeah, what have we been using to, to build this architecture? Um, that looks like um, this. Uh, all our infrastructure was running on, uh, on AWS, and on top of AWS, we were running um, Kubernetes and Kafka, which was managed by the Gracenode operations team, which was a, a huge help. I've been operating uh, Kafka clusters earlier, and it's just a lot of a lot of work. But luckily, this time around, I didn't have to bother with that. Um, and on top of Kubernetes, we were running our services um, in uh, in yeah, well, basically Docker containers running Scala applications, and those Scala applications were using uh, both Kafka streams as well as uh, Reactive Kafka to uh, interact with, uh, with Kafka. And next to that, we had uh, Kamon, which is a great library for uh, creating metrics in your Scala applications. I can really recommend that one. Um, and those metrics were being uh, pushed towards both uh, Graphite for kind of a legacy way of dealing with stuff, and as well as Prometheus, which was also running on Kubernetes. And for extra insights, we also used Instana to get insights into our entire stack, not just the Scala applications. Um, yeah, so that sounds all pretty cool, but um, yeah, give us some stats. How was this uh, working? What did we have to deal with? Um, so yeah, Gracenode has about 30-ish businesses that were using this product, um, and that led to having over, over 200 million uh, users within those two and a half, uh, two and a half weeks. And from the ODF, we reached about somewhere between 50 and 150 messages per minute, which is yeah, not that much. Um, but we had a nice processing latency from ingestion to being available in our API of about 500 milliseconds, which compared to the 40 seconds 
that we had before is just a huge improvement. Uh, and just for those uh, messages per minute, uh, I also wanted to include the stat that we could go a bit faster. <laughs> um, so yeah, a, a typical day of Olympics looks uh, kind of like this. Um, at about 1 a.m. Dutch time, people started sending out data that the Olympics were in Korea for whoever doesn't know. Um, so that was a bit of a weird time zone for, uh, for us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they started sending their data at 1 a.m., which uh, just continued until about, what does it say, about 4 o'clock, something like that. And after that, there were no more updates. Um, but Grace Note being a, a, a global company, y you see that our API had to deal with a, a constant load of, of requests. Um, which nicely stays between, uh, below the, uh, so if you look at the response times, it's the 95th percentile that stayed below uh, 40 milliseconds. And I don't know what happened here, but at some point we just dropped below 20. Maybe we did a good deployment, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, I think you guys came here to see some uh, usages of, well, uh, what do you do with Kafka? So I'm gonna give you a few examples of, uh, of those. Um, right, so like I said earlier, we were, we were using uh, two clients basically to interact with uh, Kafka, one of them being uh, Kafka Streams. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's a very lightweight library that you can easily integrate with your service. It doesn't require you to have like a, a proper cluster set up already, um, like you, you do need if you wanna do Spark streaming. Um, it's super powerful if you wanna do uh, stateful operations because it uses uh, Kafka, again, as a backend to store its state. Uh, and it's mostly useful for um, processing files, getting stuff from Kafka, and inserting updates again back into Kafka. Um, and on the other side, we were using uh, Reactive Kafka, which is uh, a Streams library, which leverages uh, Kafka consumers and producers under the hood to build up sources and syncs uh, relevant to uh, Kafka. And we, we fall back to this library whenever uh, Kafka Streams wasn't that suitable for us. And I'll give you a few examples of that as well. Um, but starting off with a few uh, Kafka Streams ones. Um, so yeah, if you look at this one, which was relevant for, I think it's a snowboarding event. Yeah, Red Jar or the snowboarding. Um, what you see here is an, is an expansion of uh, extra details of what, what this athlete did during his uh, participation in, in, in the snowboarding event. And what you see here, and that's very typical of, of snowboarding, is that every athlete gets to go down the slopes three times and try to get a best score. Um, so that's all the three columns that you see here. He, he did three runs and we nicely showed that thing in, in one view, which is something that you want as a, as a user of this, uh, of this data. Um, however, the ODF doesn't deliver this information um, together in, in, in like in one message. It gives you results per run and, and, and that's it. So what you see on the left side is uh, what it would look like um, for a run one and on the right side you'd see what it looks like for a run two. So whenever an athlete finishes one of his runs, you get a new update of these files, but it only shows, ah, in run one, these were all the results for um, all the athletes that competed in that run. And the same thing for run two. Um, the only real difference that you see here, besides the scores, is um, these two headers that were on top of the files. And really the only thing that's different there is this bit here, where you see that the one and the two indicate that these are different runs. Um, and yeah, since these are the keys that we were using um, in our streams to partition our data, we want to handle the updates per uh, sport event sequentially so that we don't update our state in a wrong order. Um, we had to do something here because the, these keys weren't leading to the right updates. Um, so what we had to do is, is basically uh, graphed here in this diagram. Um, uh, you see different colors here for event or updates that basically ended up on a different um, in a different order, so different uh, runs or units as a more generic term. And what we wanted to do in order to combine these things is to aggregate all our events or all our, what's the right word, um, all our messages basically um, for all these units. 
um, which you see nicely here. The, 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 the updates are flowing into the results detail parts aggregator, basically. Um, they are stored together in this, in this small bucket. And then um, once everything is there, you can export a message saying, hey, these are all the relevant pieces of information. This is the full results detail. Um, yeah, so what does this look like in Kafka Streams code? It's, it's this small bit of code. So given a case stream of uh, results that uh, ha as keys has these strings, which are these document codes, um, we want to disca discard the, the unit bit of information, basically de detailing which run this is. We don't care about the run. We want all the relevant information for, for everything for that event. Um, so we discard that, and, um, which means that we need to uh, basically repartition our data. So what Kafka Streams will do under the hood here is create an intermediate topic where the uh, rekeyed uh, stuff is being uh, put on. Um, but once that is rekeyed, you can group by that key and then aggregate over it. Um, so in the first line of this aggregate, you see that we have a, a multi-unit aggregate that is first empty. There, there's nothing there yet. And the second line there on line eight shows that once we get a new update, we add it to our aggregate. So if we have more information for run one, we put it in there. If we have more information for run two, we put it in there. Um, if we get another update for run two, we overwrite the previous stuff that we had for run two, but we keep it together with the one from run one still, et cetera, et cetera. And once that's there, we basically map that aggregate to a, a more richer uh, piece of information, which was that full results detail thing that we saw in the, in the widgets. Um, um, in, a, in a similar vein, but a bit more um, interesting is this one. I already touched upon it earlier, but you see all kinds of pieces of information here. You see um, the current participant, you see people, the one that's leading, you see who's coming next, you see the actual results, you see how many people have finished and how, people are, how many still need to start. Um, so we had this DT current file that, that said, this is the one that the, the person that's actually current, and this is the person that is next. We can use that bit of information, but we're still not there yet. We need to join this information together with that other result file, and I'm going to use this one, um, that, we, uh, that we also saw. And, and we can use this one to get that progress bar information um, via uh, these starters and uh, how many have completed. Um, as well as the intermediate results that uh, are in there. Uh, similarly, there's also messages called DT cumulative results, which uh, are somewhat similar to this one, but give more information about the, the total uh, score that people have, have gained over, over an event. Um, but yeah, how, we, we want to join this information together, basically, and that looks like um, this diagram. So uh, we get updates, um, we get DT current files, and we get results. We also get cumulative results, which may have the wrong key that we need to rekey. Um, and eventually, we want to join those, all those pieces of information together um, and again aggregate over that one and send out an update once we get new information. Kind of similar to what we saw earlier, but now we have multiple uh, pieces of information flowing into our system or our flow. Um, so in code, it, it's not mu much more than what we saw earlier, but yeah, it's slightly different. So in this case, we have multiple case streams, one with the current files in there, one with the results, one with the cumulative results. Um, in the diagram, we saw that we had to rekey the cumulative results, so that's quite easy as well by just selecting a new key. And once we have these three streams, we can merge them together, group them by their key, and again, aggregate in the same way that we did earlier. And then once we get the aggregate, map the aggregate to the actual piece of information that we want to show in our API. Um, <coughs> sorry. Right. So the next one is um, one of the things that we had to build with additional data that didn't come from the ODF. So that's the information coming from the Olympic broadcasters. Um, if you may have spotted it already, but if you haven't, there's these watch buttons here. Um, one of our, the, the, the product people from uh, Gracenode told that this was the best feature that we've been build, building over the entire year. What this does is if you click on this, it will deep link into the stream of this broadcaster and just jump directly to the part where this athlete will go down the slopes. Or um, is this... 
I, yeah, I think it's alpine skiing. I don't know. Um, anyway, we had to join together data that actually came from the ODF, the results. But we also had to join this with data coming from a, a different source entirely. Um, unfortunately, they are also using the ODF schema just for their headers. It, it, it's a bit of a weird example here. Maybe I should have just faked the data and called it like BDF body or something. But um, yeah, um, these are different XML files coming from an entirely different source. This isn't coming from the Olympic venues. This is coming from broadcasters that tell us information about right now on the television, you're seeing that this athlete is now going down the slopes. Um, so there's a start keyword in there, and this is his ID. Um, you know, if, if like the, the Queen of England would be there on the television, you would see, oh, the Queen of England is waving. Um, there's all kinds of weird stuff coming uh, along in these, uh, in, in these BDF files. Um, but these are the ones that are relevant for us. We want to know whenever a participant starts, and we want to know at what time he does it, or at least when, when in the stream this happens. Um, so, yeah, given a start keyword and a participant ID that belongs to that, we want to extract the, the timestamp and put that in a relevant field. Um, so in a diagram, um, given some of the, the start list, basically the stuff from ODF that, that showed all the, the participants in there, including their results, we want to um, just aggregate those. But we wanna also want to look at the video logs and um, filter those until we only have the start keyword ones and extract the start times and aggregate over those. Given a participant, what is his start time? And then join those pieces of information together with the start lists aggregate over those, and then just output one single file that says, for every athlete in this event, this is his start time. Um, again, the code doesn't look that different, but yeah, maybe that's uh, one of the powers of Kafka streams. Um, so we have, a, in this case, a K table of start lists. We're aggregating over all these start lists. Uh, and we also have um, the video logs, which is still a stream. We filter these events to look for the start keyword, and once we found, find one, we want to extract the relevant information for an athlete. Um, again, group by that, aggregate it, so we get a, a K table of um, athlete start events or something. And given that K table of, of start times and uh, start lists, we want to join those two tables together. And once there's an update on, one of, on, on either the start lists or one of the video logs, we want to output a new uh, object that says, hey, this is all the relevant information for a single, um, well, watch run um, message, as we've been calling it. Um, so yeah, that's basically it for uh, Kafka streams, I think, yeah. So then we have an example um, for uh, reactive Kafka. And the diagram looks a bit different here than what we've been seeing earlier. Um, the interesting bit being here is that as data flows through this, this flow, we're tra traversing the network to write to a database instead of uh, Kafka or, or, yeah, well, d d d we're not interacting with Kafka at all there. Um, and that's actually where reactive Kafka became interesting for us because Kafka Streams doesn't really have a, a good way of dealing with uh, asynchronous programming as we often do in, in, in Scala. As soon as you get a future, you're, you're basically uh, kind of screwed in, 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 in Kafka streams. You can await that future, but I don't see anybody shivering, but I just mentioned the word await, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and Reactive Kafka actually has a good way of dealing with asynchronous programming. Um, so that's actually why we um, just grabbed that, um, that client, type of client in, in, the, in those cases. So in, in, in this case, this was the part where um, we already had these messages coming from our processor um, ending up on a new Kafka topic, um, but those aren't still really queryable by our API. So what we did was we created this application that consumed from that Kafka topic and grabbed all these pre-processed pre and prepared API calls, um, grabbed them from Kafka and inserted them in a Mongo database. And from that point onward, it published a new kind of message um, on a new uh, Kafka topic <laughs> uh, that de detailed uh, d this piece of information has changed and that could then be leveraged by other kinds of consumers, whoever was interested to do other kinds of uh, things with that notification. Um, for example, we could use it to purge our uh, caches for our APIs. 
um, as well as push data to our non-API clients. Um, and this is actually super simple to do in, um, in Reactive Kafka. So um, you start a source of, of messages in Reactive Kafka by just writing consumer.committable source. And you give it some consumer settings as you normally do with a Kafka consumer. And you tell it which topics to, su to subscribe to. All pretty, uh, pretty much straightforward. And from that point onwards, you can do all your mapping, flat mapping, and what have you. Basically, anything you can do in, uh, in echo streams. And in this case, we have the map async operator, which uh, allows us to do uh, basically asynchronous programming. In this case, we send our update to the database, and then we map that database result to a new message um, that we can leverage later. Um, so once that future completes, it will um, be picked up again by the following uh, map operation, and it will then be transformed to an update notification. And once that update notification has been created, it will be uh, written, down, written to Kafka again using uh, a Kafka producer, which is, in this case, a committable sync using some producer settings that tell Reactive Kafka which topic it should use to write to um, and what other kind of um, configurable properties it has. Um, so yeah, eight lines of code. <laughs> um, some other thing that isn't really well suited, suitable for uh, Kafka streams is uh, time-based operations. You can do kind of windowing in, in, in Kafka streams, but the, um, the difficult part is to, like, I, I want a batch of uh, five seconds. That's just not something that Kafka streams um, supports really well. You can tell it, I want to get all updates that fall within this, this window, and you get these updates um, when they're there, but you, you don't get a, like a full batch after that, that window has been closed. You need a new message that will actually get a new window. It's, it, it's kind of awkward to work with, but, but for good reasons. They have very good blog posts about why this works, but that's not, um, not always what you want. So in our case, we had these updates notifications, right? And we can transform those update notifications to basically URLs that need to be purged from our, uh, our CDN um, that we've also been using as a, as a cache, basically. Um, but yeah, we basically don't want to DDoS the API that says, please purge this URL, because that URL will probably be the same if you have a live running event. You want to do that in a, in a bit of more uh, controlled manner. Um, so basically, you want to deduplicate uh, URLs over a small uh, period of time, for, for example, uh, like five seconds or something. Um, and that piece of windowing is something that Reactive Kafka can actually do quite well, and Kafka Streams just doesn't support. Um, so yeah, you want to do that deduplication, and then still, you don't want to just do single requests of, please purge this one URL, uh, dear uh, CDN provider. I want to basically purge this set of URLs, so you may want to do some batching uh, before you do your request to some kind of external API. So that's why there's a batch operator in here as well. Um, and there may also be some rate limits involved that you want to uh, adhere to. Um, and that's also something that is super easy to do in, uh, in Reactive Kafka. Um, the code is a bit more than what we've been seeing previously, but it, it still fits on a single slide, so I think that's uh, kind of okay. Um, so yeah, given a, a flow of, of messages that come uh, into our, our system, we want to map those messages, or basically we want to group those messages within uh, a specific uh, deduplication, deduplication batch time. I'll just get rid of this zoom in thing. Um, so we want to group within. We're gonna want to group within that batch time, and then once we have that batch, we want to. Um, map over that batch basically by uh, deduplicating all the URLs that are in there. And after we've done that deduplication, we want to again um, group within a batch with a another batch time in there, which may or may not be uh, smaller. And we also may want to limit the, the maximum size of our batch, um, depending on what our external API uh, allows. But once we get a new batch, we can um, transform that one again, as you see here. And then uh, that rate limit that we saw earlier is just a single line here where you say, please throttle this stream um, with uh, requests per second per, you know, one, one second here. Um, and as messages flow through that part, um, we can map that batch again to, uh, to an asynchronous request 
to our external API that says, please purge this uh, set of URLs. And once that's completed, we can commit back to Kafka that we actually handled, handled all these requests uh, properly. So this seems, well, pretty powerful and uh, yeah, pretty cool. So well, that's it for our uh, reactive uh, Kafka examples. So um, we saw some nice use cases, um, but you still need to run this in, in, in prod and having good code examples and running stuff properly in prod may be something different. So I wanna give some, some pointers and some, show some stuff that we've been running into uh, while, um, while preparing or actually running uh, our operations. Um, yeah, so starting with, um, I'm not gonna start with unit test. Do your unit test, please. Um, but uh, integration tests may or may not be a bit uh, difficult. In case of Kafka, it, it kind of is. Um, but there's good solutions. Um, if you're using Scala test, there's a, quite a good uh, library called Scala test embedded Kafka, which you can use to start up, your, uh, start up a Kafka cluster uh, in a very controlled manner. Uh, it will run embedded within a, within a JVM and you can really accurately control I want to publish a message on this topic, and I want to see what comes out at this, uh, at this other one. Um, so that's kind of good. But something that we also uh, used quite often uh, was just uh, this library that you can use to start up Docker containers from Scala. It's called Docker IT Scala from Wisk Labs. It's a pro uh, project that I've been using quite often, and it's really quite good. But yeah, it, it, it allows you to interact with Docker from Scala. And we've been using that to start up Kafka and assort, assorted other uh, dependencies as black boxes. Um, and we, can, we could use that to just well, run our entire application and just fire off new events and see how our application uh, deals with it. Um, so that was really good in terms of integration testing. Uh, we also did uh, a load of load testing. Um, and we had two kinds of approaches here. Um, one of them being just simple API uh, load testing, which is not that hard, uh, so we, we used a tool for that called uh, <laughs> Vegeta. <laughs> uh, you can use that to uh, blast away at your API. Um, it's very, very scriptable, so you can easily uh, distribute it over multiple, um, multiple servers. Uh, a lot of our colleagues have been writing smaller scripts called Goku and whatever, uh, say an army, to distribute it over uh, multiple uh, servers. servers. Um, so that's very good for the API load testing. Um, but yeah, testing these, these Kafka kind of things where data flows into your system and you wanna see that the latency is low and you're, you're not accumulating more lag, that, that becomes a bit more uh, interesting. Um, but in the case of ODF, um, we're actually kind of uh, in luck um, because there's a lot of um, testing, test events actually that, that go on um, pre-Olympics um, in which actual ODF files are generated and we can just uh, capture all those and. Um, like, like build up a very good suite of, of, of test information that we can uh, replay later, um, which is exactly what we did. We just grabbed together uh, basically all the test events that we could find and just blast that at, at our ingest service and just see um, how many files can we ingest until we start accumulating lag on, on one of our uh, applications. Um, so that's actually how we figured out that it was about uh, 2,000 messages per minute that we got just without any kind of tweaking. So at that point we thought, well, good job. There's no extra tweaking needed because we're just gonna get way less information anyways. Um, but yeah, once you actually do need to start tweaking, um, we couldn't help ourselves. We still kind of did it. <laughs> um, we noticed that it, it's a bit hard to um, really make your application um, really optimal uh, for your workload, in, in, at least in this version of Kafka Streams, because the way Kafka Streams distributed, distributes its, its work is it, it acknowledges this, this concept of a task. Um, basically, grab this, this, this message from, from Kafka, transform it, and write it back to Kafka again. Those tasks are all considered equally as costly and are just distributed randomly over all your applications within your uh, Kafka Streams uh, cluster. Um, but yeah, these tasks typically aren't equally as costly. Um, grabbing these huge XML files and parsing them and grabbing out relevant information is way more costly than just grabbing a single key from, from one of your Scala objects and 
returning that. So uh, that's a bit weird, and that can lead to one of your instances by, ra by random chance getting all the tasks that are super difficult and take a lot of load, and then another, another instance within your uh, cluster getting basically yeah, nothing to do. Um, luckily, there's a fix planned for 1.2.0, so I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. I think it'll still be a while, but eh, at least they're working on it. Um, yeah, and for similar reasons, it's a bit hard to accurately do capacity planning, um, but because, for example, that that task assignment that we saw earlier is it's built up on, on deployment time, your application startup, and this work is distributed over your instances, but the way that those partitions are assigned is more like a, a hint to your cluster. Please try to align yourselves in this way, but there's no like um, guarantee that your cluster will actually um, will distribute their load in that way. Um, so it's a bit of like, you need to retry and retry and retry. And if you try enough times, you will probably find like a good average on um, what kind of capacity you need. But yeah, these estimates aren't like, you, you can't do it within five seconds. You need to start up your application, uh, start producing a lot of files, and maybe let, let it run for about half an hour. And that will give you just one single data point. And if you want to do that uh, very often, it's just not that workable. Um, they do have very good documentation, though, about um, what kind of things you need to think about, uh, your buffer sizes, your number of partitions, stateful operations that you're doing, all that kind of stuff is, um, yeah, they're, they're giving quite a few good examples in there. Um, yeah. Um, so one, one other thing that we ran into is that error handling. Um, it is important, and there's basically almost no support for it in, in Kafka streams. What they want you to do is wrap everything in a try-catch block and uh, do your, handling, your error handling um, in whatever way uh, fits your needs. But yeah, that requires some kind of um, like diligent work from your developers. And although we try our best, it, it, we may fail to do it properly sometimes, um, which can lead to poison pills in your Kafka Streams application, um, which is a very bad thing. Um, so being able to skip over these messages may prove uh, very useful. Um, and we've actually used this in production, I think, a few times, sadly. But yeah, nowadays, uh, I think since Kafka 0.11, there's a very good command line tool to um, reset your offsets. And you can use that to skip a single message or something. So that's, uh, or just skip everything that you've been building up in terms of, uh, of, of queues or lag. Um, but yeah, that's kind of useful. Um, again, Reactive Kafka was actually a bit better in terms of error handling. Echo Streams has quite a few good ways to deal with errors. You can skip messages and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but one thing we actually did run into is that there's a very good piece of documentation, or maybe it's not good at all. Um, on the Reactive Kafka website, they tell you, uh, they give an example of how you should restart your application once you run into failures. And that kind of works most of the time, but sometimes, and I think this is just a bug in, in the Reactive Kafka library, but sometimes when we ran into an issue, our application try to restart, and what, what Kafka consumers typically do when they restart is that they, well, reassign the work that they've been uh, doing. And what happened was that partitions did get assigned to our consumers, but for some reason they just didn't consume from those topics anymore. And that what was really kind of awkward because yeah, you want to keep consuming from your petitions. Anyway, what we eventually did was just, we didn't do anything um, related to that restart behavior that they advise on the Reactive Kafka documentation. And what we did was just, just let the application crash and let our uh, supervisor, uh, in this case, uh, Kubernetes, uh, to just restart our application. And when it just booted up from scratch, everything went just fine. Um, so yeah, the nice piece of documentation about error handling uh, has been linked there. I'll probably share these slides afterwards. Um, and there's also plenty of GitHub issues with like these um, partitions that get stuck. There, there's plenty of issues on the Reactive Kafka uh, uh, library that um, are being mentioned, and I expect that it will be fixed sometime soon. But yeah, be aware of that. It's it's an, a thing. 
And I don't think I can mention it, it often enough, but please monitor your offsets. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's about it. Um, so we, we saw today we saw a few examples of how um, Kafka streams can help with your stream processing, especially when you're doing stateful operations. Um, but in some cases, you want to resolve back to uh, reactive Kafka, which can help out uh, when you're doing uh, asynchronous programming or time-based operations or uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I also gave some nice examples of how to prepare for your, uh, to run your stuff in prod. And uh, I guess that's it. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, applause, yay. <laughs> Any questions so far? If not, I do have a question for you because you alluded to it <laughs> in the beginning, but you said <coughs> someone else in your family has also done something at the Olympics. <laughs> right, and yeah. And you just left it hanging there. <laughs> yeah, so my dad competed in the uh, 88, uh, 88 Olympics in Seoul. So we both were somehow evolved, involved. Almost the same thing, in, right? In a South Korea uh, Olympic yeah. event. And he, yeah. he was... He was also 27. Yeah, but it was <laughs> like, it's like you were working with streams and he was working with streams. <laughs> yeah, he was a sailor. <laughs> yeah, he was a sailor. Okay, good. Anyway. That's a good one. <laughs> that's my joke for today. Uh, okay, so any other questions so far? Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, uh, XML and the skew problem. So I understand that processing huge XML is harder than pro processing small events. Mm. But you also mentioned that those XMLs get distributed randomly. So I don't get how it's a problem and what would be the solution for that. Um, I'm not sure if I said that files were distributed randomly um, because we actually had a very uh, strict way of dealing with how events were published uh, in our case because um, basically what the ODF was sending out is this is the full new state of this event, and we actually want to process those messages uh, sequentially because we don't want to have like an, uh, an update for timestamp uh, 10 to precede a message from timestamp uh, 9, for example. Uh, so we, we actually wanted to process those messages in order. Um, so order the distribution, distribution of our messages was actually fixed and not random. And one more, uh, Kubernetes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, can can you just uh, tell us a, a bit more, like um, any conclusions from from running it and problems? Um, worked pretty nicely, <laughs> actually. Uh, yeah, I was really happy with it. Um, yeah, maybe somebody else, uh, Hamza. It worked really fine, right? The, the the UI provided uh, with Kubernetes is a bit lacking. It yeah, it doesn't have auto refresh. So if you want to monitor, you better have a good uh, monitoring solution on the side. Um, also, uh, yeah, we had to create a lot of tooling on the side for like live logs and stuff like that uh, for for tailing instances. Uh, I'd say that it, they could improve that aspect. Yeah, but in terms of keeping our stuff running, it was actually really really good. Yeah, we didn't have really any issues for running stuff, except when we run out of memory. It's really hard to figure out that a pod was killed mm -hmm. from lack of memory. You had to dig really deep. It's like a basic thing, but that's not something obvious when you work with Kubernetes. Yeah, I've seen a lot of blog posts nowadays that actually give a detailed uh, description of how you debug that one. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So actually, <laughs> I want to point out that we have do uh, do other have other colleagues here that worked on the same project. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Hamza was there ask, and uh, Mikhail was there. Mikhail's there. Yeah. Mm, I'm not seeing Mozart. No, I also see other colleagues from Grace Note. So yeah. thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some other questions, maybe so far? No, not really. Do you have a, Do you have a picture of the command center that you were in at night? <laughs> you have it lying I, 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 I could dig that, up that one. Because yeah, you, sure. you were actually one of the people <laughs> who were sitting there in the middle of the night when the Olympics so were let, going Let on. me look that one up. These are, of course, the most interesting things for us <laughs> to see, right? Most visual thing. Okay, yeah, is, is, is it allowed to show it? <laughs> <laughs> we get I think in trouble. Is. They are here, so. <laughs> 
I'll put it up on the screen later. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try looking for it. I don't think it's on my laptop. Yeah, it's in Slack, okay, definitely. Yeah. If there's yeah. any other questions, no questions, uh, then I would like to thank you very much. One more You're time. Welcome. And also Martin, thank you very much.